This episode of Primitive Culture is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for smartphone, tablet, and desktop. To get a free audiobook of your choice and help Trek FM at the same time, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. And also by Enterprise in Space, an international program of the non-profit National Space Society. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter by visiting enterpriseinspace.org. This is Tim Russ, Lieutenant Commander Tuvok on Star Trek Voyager, and you're listening to Trek FM. Open your mind to the past. Oh, this may mean something. It's a primitive culture. I'm just trying to blend in. Some people think the future means the end of history. We haven't run out of history quite yet. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Primitive Culture, a Trek FM podcast all about our history, our culture, and how Star Trek relates to it. I'm Duncan Barrett, and uh, my co-host Tony is is still on a very long, extended uh, trip to Risa. I hope nothing bad's happened to him. I think when someone goes to Risa for this length of time, you kind of start worrying maybe they've been abducted or something. But Joining me this week in his stead are two very wonderful guests from the Trek FM network. Uh, we've got Zach Moore from Standard Orbit, and we've got Mike Schindler from Stage 9 and the new Discovery podcast, The Edge. And the topic that we're going to be talking about this week is something that they know everything about and I know absolutely nothing about. It's baseball. So hi, Zach and Mike. Good to see you. How are you doing? Good, good. Thanks for having us. Yeah, Duncan, thanks for... Uh, uh asking about our baseball knowledge i don't know if we know everything but we know a lot so we're looking forward to to dropping some knowledge on you guys across the pond there it'll be easy to fool me don't worry (laughs) so you two guys are pinch hitting for tony this week oh look at that that's one thing i've learned there you go yeah yeah. well done (laughs) and i I picked that up from deep space nine so (laughs) that's basically probably pretty much all my baseball knowledge comes from either Field of Dreams or Deep Space Nine. So that's that's what you've <laughs> you need got a poster that says with. everything I know about baseball I learned from Star Trek. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, the Field of <laughs> Dreams. I mean, it, it's pretty much. I know this is an unpopular opinion, but it's pretty much a garbage movie. But it is all about the White Sox. So you know, I, I'm glad I'm glad you're about the White Sox here, guys. <laughs> because so so Mike and I have this thing. Mike is a White Sox fan, Chicago White Sox fan. Mm-hmm. I. I'm a Houston Astros fan, and the Houston Astros have been in the World Series one time. It was in 2005. It was a glorious time. It was a great. It was a great run for the Houston Astros. Uh, in the late 90s, mid 2000s, we were one of the best teams in baseball, and we are again, thank goodness, because everything comes around. Everything is cyclical because time is not linear and emissary, and we'll tie all stuff together <laughs> later. But anyway, the White Sox swept the Astros in the World Series, so I do not like the White Sox at all. I'm not a White Sox fan. Do, do, you, do you know what it means to sweep someone? Nope. Okay. It, <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure. I, I, I barely know what the World Series is. So, you know, the World but Ser- I gather it's a big deal. And, and I get the impression it doesn't really apply to the whole world. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, um, I mean, okay. we, we have the World <laughs> Baseball Classic for that, but that's that's... Uh, it's in, that's even more inside baseball, so to speak. I feel like I feel like we are Cisco here, Mike, and then <laughs> Duncan is the prophet, so we have to this explain is, yeah. to him the concept of baseball. Well, you right. see, I was because I was watching Emissary this week, and and there's that scene where he starts to explain how to play baseball, and then he basically gives up and says, "Well, you know, it doesn't really matter. Uh, it's it's a game of chance. It's it's not linear. That's the point." And I was a bit disappointed because I was kind of thinking, "Oh, you know, he's gonna he's gonna make sense of this for me. I'm gonna know what's going on." Um, so yeah, maybe I mean basically. I, I'm not a prophet, I'm not a wormhole alien, but I am an English person, which, as far as baseball is concerned, is, you know, maybe only one step up the rung. So why don't we start with that? Uh, Teach me how to play baseball. Okay, well, um, (laughs) I don't know. The thing that I I love about the rules of baseball is everything seems to be divisible by three, you know? Mm -hmm. Three, Three outs in an inning, you know, nine innings in a game three strikes in and out, you know, you know, all this stuff. And uh, aside from the bases, there's four bases, but, you know, whatever. Four balls so, for walk, right? right. Yeah, yeah, that whatever. <laughs> you know, so, so I don't know. I mean, it's just, uh, I think that the thing about baseball, which sort of makes it different from other sports, is 
there isn't a ticking clock, you know? It's very sort of, uh, I, I guess, linear in a sense, you know, like, like Cisco is saying, you know, every single play, every single pitch sort of changes the, the game and, you know, leads to the next pitch. And then, you know, it's it's all about sort of like counting this number of, of outs, you know, and, and whatever happens in between those outs counts, right? But because of that, there's no running out the clock, you know, it's like everyone has a fair chance until the very end when the, the final out is recorded. And that to me is, is like what, what makes it most different from other sports. Does this mean that it, it basically goes on forever? Because um, we have a game over here called cricket, which again, I, I don't profess to know all that much about. But one thing I know about cricket is the matches seem to just go on and on and on uh, almost well, indefinitely. Th- that is a common criticism of baseball. Uh, you know, it used right. to be America's pastime, you know, back in the, mm-hmm. in the early 20th century. And yet as as society has gotten more shall we say, ADD <laughs> and their entertainment needs, uh, baseball has kind of fallen out of favor. Uh, and, as Star Trek predicts, you know, yeah. <laughs> it, uh, yeah, yeah, it completely uh, dies off, Dr. which is, which is sad. Yeah. But, uh, Lots to impatience. I know I have to go all the way to Cessus 3 to watch a real baseball game. But the... <laughs> Uh, the, the thing about baseball, like Mike was saying, is there is no there is no clock, you know. So, so if if nobody scores, you just keep playing until somebody scores. If it's tied, you just keep playing, and then if somebody ties it back up, keeps going, going, going. Some of the best baseball games of all time have gone to extra innings, uh, which which I refer to as free baseball, right? Because you pay for a baseball game, you get nine innings, but if it keeps going. You know, you'd have I. You know, I mentioned I mentioned the Astros off the top in two thousand four. The Astros had an epic playoff game versus the Atlanta Braves. It went eighteen innings, and we won on a walk off home run by by Chris Burke. Uh, so th- there's some inside baseball for I use that term a lot. Podcasting inside baseball. That, what that means that that's like when people are talking way too deep into things that no one. <laughs> <laughs> that no one outside the subject area understands or probably even cares about. It's, it's but you're all throw, right. Don't worry, because I can't tell the anyway. difference. So, um, you know. <laughs> but isn't, isn't that crazy? Like, like say that, uh, I'm just trying to think of a, another analogy, but, like, if you went to... If you went to a concert, right? If, if you went and saw, like, the Eagles or something, and they were had, like, a, a two-hour set, but mm. guess what? They're going to play for four hours instead, right? I mean, that, that's like... <laughs> what a value that is right if you can some people get tired of it right but i love baseball so i'm like this is great and, and as it continues as the game continues especially in the extra innings the stakes go up because any it's like sudden death at that point like whoever scores next in this inning if they stay ahead they win the game so everything becomes even more important even you know throughout the whole game it's just as important but it just feels a lot more important at the end of the game much like again another criticism of baseball I'm always defending it to people, right? So I you know these criticisms. Uh, it's 162 games, which is a lot of games. Okay, like I've had friends that I've started getting into baseball. Like that's that's ridiculous. I'm like I know, but it's it's like a marathon. It's not a sprint, right? So like the games in April and May, it's usually the baseball season is usually from the beginning of April to the end of September, beginning of October, and then October is the playoffs, like the whole month. So the games in April and May and June they, they count just as much. As the games in October, obviously, all the games are equal. But for whatever reason, people like in October, people get all like, oh, man, we got to every game counts now. I'm like, well, guys, it, it all counted all along. If you would have just a lot of frustrations as a baseball fan is your team gets in a slump and you're like, if you would have taken care of business in April or May, you wouldn't be scrambling to try and salvage your season in September. But anyway, you know, I think I think a great introductory court course, if you will, to baseball will be uh, Ken Burns documentary. On baseball, are you familiar with the documentarian Ken Burns? Okay, is he the guy who made documentaries about the war? Yeah, yes, he, he, I think of someone else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. C- Civil right. War. I, th- probably I think his I might have seen one. one of them. Yeah, yeah. He's okay. uh, well. It's much like baseball. It's very long. I think it's. I think he has. It's nine. I mean, he. he you know, he, he <laughs> followed the format. It's like nine chapters or whatever. And he actually had an updated one that came out just a few years ago, I believe. Because uh, it's he made it in the early nineties, so it's like you know from the inception of the game until the early 90s and then so much has happened in baseball in the last you know 15 20 years that that it it required an update of some kind but but he makes points about like there being no clock it's the only sport where the defense has the ball 
the ever usually you know basketball football you have the ball the ball is the object that you need to cross a plane or go through a bucket or enter a net of some kind baseball it's not that way the defense can can handle the ball uh and the ball is like the the ball is not something the offense handles it's they they, they just hit with their bat and then you know then they can't touch the ball anymore like if you get hit by a ball you're out in baseball you know uh right. yeah, when yeah. you're on the offense so so that's that's something different and then something that fascinates me about baseball as well is the uh there's just a lot of there's a lot more character and flavor to each individual uh, stadium you know i mean every every stadium has different dimensions which you know i just accept because i grew up watching and playing baseball and but if you think about it that's really weird isn't it like <laughs> but the pitch is the same surely <laughs> yeah the distance between the pitcher's mound and the home plate and the and the actual dimensions of you know the first second third and home the, the diamond uh infield yeah. those dimensions are always the same those are universal but do you mean the area around that is in play the dirt area with the bases and everything like that's the infield yeah. but then mm-hmm. like if you go beyond that where there's all that that grass okay that's that's yeah, yeah. that's the outfield that that's where the angels are yes <laughs> and the thing <laughs> the thing about the outfield you know it, it, what what Zach's referring to is you know each stadium the the actual shape of the field is different so like you have these set parameters in the infield and you have like like a a a range in which the outfield needs to fall into like the fences in the back need to be at least you know 315 feet or whatever it is but beyond that you can do weird things in terms of the shape of the field so like uh, for example uh Zach's uh, beloved Astro Stadium used to have a hill in the in center field which you know would signal that you're getting close to the wall and then there'd be a giant flagpole in the middle of that hill right it was a throwback to an earlier time it was called yeah. Tal's hill which was our president of operations his name was Tal smith and when they were d- designing in Ron field at the time uh they it was it's it was attached to it is attached to an old train station union station so they wanted to go all throwback with it and in the early days of baseball they had absurd things like that like oh here's a hill and a flagpole it's in play that people can run so, into. So, <laughs> so you can put anything you like there. So presumably it, it gives you a real home advantage if, you know, yeah, you know, a literally the, the home more field wacky you, you, yeah. make, <laughs> you make your pitch, then the more uh, confusing it's going to be. Yeah, then, that, that, you also, you know, depending on the dimensions of your field and stuff like that, you can construct your team in order to play to that field's strengths. You know, like, for example, mm-hmm. in, oh, okay. in Boston, which is the oldest... I think they're the oldest, or is Wrigley the oldest? I, don't I think know. I think they're one or two years apart from each other. Yeah. Anyway, it's really freaking old, and it's falling apart, and whatever. But you know, <laughs> uh, because of that, because it was like this field which was built in a residential area like a hundred years ago, you know, they had to kind of cram it in, and because of that, like in on one side, the 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 wall which you would hit the ball over for a home run is really really close to to home plate but in order to compensate for that the wall is really really tall like what like 30 or 40 feet tall i mean mm-hmm. you know and the then green the, monster as they call it the green monster yes and then on the other side you know it's it's further away you know but has like a, a weird you know sort of curve to it and it's it's just sort of like a unique thing and, and one of the things that that sort of makes you know baseball unique like zach is saying you know each stadium does have its own feel to it and it's actually a, a criticism which uh, people had of of stadiums that were constructed in like the 60s and 70s was that they were doing these like all purpose stadiums so that they could be used for both baseball and football and they were just big giant circles and everyone cookie hated cutter stadiums it. yeah cookie cutter no, stadiums no character to them at all yeah everyone hated it because they were just so generic and now they've certainly trended towards what you're seeing in Houston with these sort of unique throwback you know things but i mean it's a thing that people do it's a thing which i've tried to do and have sort of failed at but you know people will go around the country visiting every single stadium because they're all so different from each other i know? do that yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Now, it's interesting, you mentioned football, or obviously, as, as we call it on this side of the pond, American football, because it's, yes, qu- yes. it's quite different from, from what we think of as football. It is, I mean, it's interesting, it strikes me, that's a sport that 
doesn't crop up in Star Trek, but obviously is hugely popular in the United States. Are, are people fans of both? Are you kind of a football guy or a baseball guy? I mean, is there a kind of... It, it, it seems to me like the football is a bit more uh, physical and sort of tough and aggressive, I suppose, and baseball is maybe a bit more... Not laid back exactly, but more of a nice day out and a kind of... Do you know what I mean? Like this idea yeah. of a slightly slower pace of life. I know exactly what that, you mean. Does that translate to different kinds of fans and different kinds of of behavior or, or, well, or interests? Or? Well, football is more of an event. You know, it's a weekly event. There's less games. Uh, there's 16 games a season, plus the postseason lasts, you know, about a month and a half. So uh, that's something that you can all plan you know, and all get together. It's like a like a social, uh, just a nexus of, of of activity. Like, okay, guys, Sunday the big game. You know, and then and then it's like all day, right? There's football like in Sunday uh, at noon, and there's an afternoon game. And then there's like a night game now, and it's just football NFL. You know, now and now it has Monday night games and Thursday night games. But but regardless of all that, there's a set time where like all the football is happening. And so you can sit down and make a day of it and, like, make an event, have your friends over, have a big party every Sunday if you want, and a lot of people do. Baseball, again, it's more like a marathon. There's, like, almost a baseball game almost every day for, like, you know, oh, wow. okay. six <laughs> months. You know, Because, you know, 162 games over the course of six months, you know. I mean, there's, there's a probably you get one off day a week, you know, usually for travel. And there was a baseball game on every day. And baseball, it just, it, it feels good because it's always there for you. You know, like, it, it's always on the background. Like, if I'm, like, doing chores or, or doing, you know, my finances or whatever for the month, i like, oh, good, there, baseball game's on. Yeah, see how the Astros are doing. I can go about my business. It's just something that, like, you can and go along with you. It's kind of, you know, kind of like podcasting, right? Presumably a big part of this is, I mean, this game must have not always been professional right because because in star trek they talk a bit about how it it stopped being a professional game and you know i think that there's that discussion in uh, if wishes were horses about the last is it the last professional game they played where only 300 people turned up and then it becomes this kind of first of all this kind of amateur hobby but also kind of it's seen as a little bit eccentric. So, so like there, there's a handful of people who know about it. So obviously Cisco knows about it. Uh, Jack Crusher apparently was, was keen on baseball, but it's kind of a slightly, not necessarily like a nerdy thing, but it, it's, it's like a, a, an interest that someone might acquire, but it's a bit obscure, I suppose, is the way of is looking at it. And presumably whenever the game was invented, it, you know, it wasn't being played by, it, by these professional teams day in, day out on this grueling schedule or whatever. It was, you know, like all those games something you might do with some mates at the weekend or whatever. I'm just kind of curious what impact that has, whether it's partly the professionalisation, because I think with sport generally, the professionalisation of sport creates a lot of problems and often takes some of the fun out of it because it becomes so much about money and so much about kind of, you know, sponsorship or about this or about that or about, you know, with television in particular, it kind of, you can lose some of what the appeal is of the actual game and i know i mean we don't have baseball over here we do have a game called rounders which is broadly speaking similar i think but that is not a game that can be played you, you know no one plays rounders professionally that's just a game that like kids play or you know at the, at the weekend in the park i suppose you, you might see a group of people playing it but it's not i don't know why that there, there's that kind of uh distinction between kind of you know games that are just games for fun and games that are like entertainment complex uh you know big bucks kind of things yeah i can speak to one angle of that i i think there's a there's a purity that gets lost you know when things get corporatized and that's that's kind of what you're speaking to there i uh you know it's like sponsored by this or that or everything has a this inning brought to you by ugh, and it's like oh, come on guys I just want to watch a baseball game here you know and the commercial breaks are so long you know that that's an adds on to another thing about baseball being so long you know, uh, sometimes, you know, playoff games can be like four hours long because they, you know, they, they have their, na- you have a, in baseball, you have these natural breaks of every, in between every inning, you know, and uh, every, in, like in between the first and second inning and then also in between the first inning, the top of the first and the bottom of the first, for example. So these natural breaks, but the bigger the games, the more, the bigger the stage, the more commercial time they sell and there's more to that. And so, you know, I'm actually one of the few people I, I know that knows that college baseball exists. In the United States, uh, my my parents are big college baseball fans, so I grew up watching it. And there's a certain purity to that as well. 
because it, you know, much like 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 you're talking about, people aren't they're not in it for the money. These people don't have huge contracts. They're just college ki- college kids playing, having a good time, and and you know they're not as good. There's errors and all kinds of craziness happens. So a lot of times the games can be a little more exciting because things that would be automatic, you know, like like um, if you hit a ground ball. Uh, to the infield, and it should be an automatic out. The shortstop should get the ball, throw it to first, no problem. Uh, that's not a guaranteed thing in college baseball. Like people are overthrowing balls and this or that, and people are missing catching pop ups in the outfield and all that. So a lot more excitement can happen uh, when there's uh, when there's not just a guaranteed. Oh well, these guys are ninety percent of the time they're going to execute. They're not always going to execute. I was sort of wondering, you know, in Star Trek, do they? I don't think I'd ever realised, having never seen a baseball game, and only having seen baseball in, like, American movies and TV shows, I don't think I'd picked up on the fact that it goes on for such a long time, or that it can... Because I, I was quite struck when, in Take Me Out to the Suite, Cisco describes it as a test of endurance, amongst other things. And that sort of surprised me, because it doesn't look like a particularly... It, it's not like you have to run a particularly large distance at a time. It's not like you have to... Like you hit the ball and then you do. Do you, do you know what I mean? There's not in in it's got that sort of start stoppy thing. It's not like it's not like a sport where someone seems to be really like on the edge of, of, of collapse the whole time. It's it's a, it's a different kind of structure to it. Is that right? Right. It's not like soccer as 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 we call yeah. it. Um, <laughs> you know, which is you know just like this constant you know running and running and running, running. around. Yeah. It's <laughs> I think it's more this this like mental endurance because. You, you really have to sort of like be focused the whole time. It's like someone throws a pitch and now the entire game situation has changed, you know, and you've got to sort of think like what happens. I mean, this is the thing which, you know, my dad would always tell me, he's like, every time, you know, there's a pitch, you got to sit there when you're in the in the in the field and think, what do you do if you get the ball, you know, and with the other endurance aspect to it, I think is just what we were talking about with the fact that the season is 162 games long you know it it is like a a real grind and you know lots of times like this is something that you would never see in football but you know in baseball since there is such a daily thing to it like you need to sort of rotate your players out every once in a while in order to just to just give your stars a rest you know like you would never you know think of like Michael Jordan getting the day off, you know, just because. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but that happens in baseball. That actually happens. I mean, it's it's a big part of the game because, like, the most important player on the team, arguably, is the pitcher, and pitchers cannot pitch on a daily basis. They can only pitch like there's usually five starting pitchers because you can only pitch like once every five days. Otherwise you know you're you're physically not able to because you're you're so sore from you know throwing 100 pitches at 100 miles an hour you know over the course of you know a couple hours and you know most pitchers won't even make it through an entire game you know there's teams have entire you know relief pitching staffs which are you know built in order to finish games for for starters who cannot finish which is almost every is very very rare that a starter actually pitches an entire game. So, you know, there there is that sort of like thinking which is different from from other sports where, you know, yeah, endurance not it's not so much about physical endurance as it is about mental endurance. We seem to keep going back as well to this idea of the kind of unpredictability of the game. I mean, is it it's it's hard for me to tell cuz like when I watch Take Me Out to the Hollow Suite, there's a kind of the the gag in that it is that no one other than Cisco understands how this game works. It seems incredibly complicated. I mean, Nana Visitor does a great job of of reciting rules so that you know with such evident confusion that it, it uh, and she and I think she starts on chapter twenty five of a book of the rules of baseball, which again makes it seem like it's enormously complicated. But obviously, like so, for me watching it, I'm I'm completely sold on the idea that it's it's bizarrely complicated and hard to follow and i have no more idea than they do what's going on but obviously for a large part of the audience that the show is written for the people writing it and so on they do presumably understand all the rules or or is it a game where there actually are lots of obscure rules that people don't know about or i mean there are so many obscure rules in baseball i i i always love it when when you're at a stadium 
and they have like you know the scoreboard when a guy's up to bat, right? They they usually mm. put some statistics up, and I always laugh with my friends like that is such a baseball statistic right there. It's just like on night games when the roof is open, you know. Uh, Jose Altuve <laughs> okay. is hitting 475. You know, it's like versus left-handed pitchers though he's hitting 585, and versus right-handers he's hitting 275. It's like what? What is this? Like this doesn't apply to anything. Those are more like statistics and weird stats that you can come up with. But there are lots of weird uh, statistics, or I'm sorry, <laughs> there are lots of weird rules in baseball, like the infield fly rule. That's you the know, one like, that they they bring up at the start of the, in that first scene. Exactly. They, yeah. That is notoriously the most complicated rule in baseball. <laughs> so go on then, explain to me the infield fly rule. Oh, you want me to do it? Of course. Um, <laughs> basically, the intention... You walked into that one, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the intention is basically, I mean, the, on a very, very basic level, you know, there's like two ways to get people out, you know? One is if you catch a fly ball before it hits the ground, that's an out. The other way is if it does hit the ground, you need to either throw it to first base, you know, or whatever, or if there's a runner on first, then you you would need to throw it to second base in order to get this person out, or you can just tag them. So if there's a high pop-up, like a ball which is hit and goes, you know, really really high up in the air so that it's staying up there for like a good period of time you know there's a sort of quandary on the part of the runners as to whether they should run to the next base or stay where they are because if see you see this is where it's getting complicated i'm assuming that people know things when they don't if you catch a ball on the fly the runner is not allowed to run to the next base until they've touched the base that they are on to begin with. So, like, once the ball hits the ground, you can just run like crazy. But if the ball is in the air and it's going to be caught, you cannot leave your base until it's it's caught, right? So, usually, if there's a fly ball and someone catches it, the runners are not going to be able to advance to the next base. But if the ball hits the ground and you're on first base, then you need to run to the next base. You're, 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 and if you don't, you're going to be out, okay? So if there's a pop-up in the air, if it's a fly ball, like, you could very easily trick the runner into not running by making it look like you're going to catch it, and then intentionally drop it at the last minute, and get him out at second base for not running to second base, and then get the guy out at first by you know and turn a double play. Does I, I, I'm guessing none of this, this, this is sounds, making this any sense. This sounds genuinely complicated. I mean, the close. I was going to say like in football, but there's, there's also a sort of joke about the <laughs> offside rule in, in in football. And I mean, I don't even watch football, and I feel now, now you're probably going to ask me to explain. I feel like I basically understand the offside rule, I think. But it's, it, people talk about it as if it's complicated because it's something that, that people don't understand. But as far as I know, that's the only like rule in football that has that kind of association. Whether whereas this sounds, this does sound like this game is is genuinely bewildering. <laughs> so well, you have that to, a lot of people are watching it and not knowing what's going on or it, not knowing it's why. Very, it, and it goes it goes again to how different baseball is from most other sports because in basketball or football there's a playbook, you know, like they're, they're like we're going to execute this play this time this guy these uh, you know uh, guys, you know, the, the team like knows where the Xs and Os and all that stuff as they say that the chalkboards and the clipboards and all that. Yeah, I have no idea what any of that is. That just <laughs> washes. That's that's like techno babble to me. <laughs> it's visual techno babble. In regards to the you know, complicated nature of the rules and everything. I really think it's the sort of thing where in terms of the basics, like if you were to watch a game with someone, you know, who could sort of explain what's happening on a, you know, play by play basis, you would pick up on most of it, you know, fairly quickly. I I remember I I went to one game um, and I was on the train ride home and there was a guy from the UK who was visiting, who went to see it, knew absolutely nothing about baseball. And, he was just kind of there to, to see it. And and we were talking and he's like, I picked up on pretty much everything except there was one time where for some reason the pitcher intentionally threw four balls out of the strike zone. It's like little things like that, you know, might seem complicated or whatever. But I think like if you're there and you're watching it, certainly by the end of the game, you would have a firm enough grasp 
of the sport to be able to understand what was going on 90% of the time? Well, I have to say one of the benefits, I think, of particularly Take Me Out to the Hollow Suite is the way that episode is written and directed and constructed and so on. Without understanding the game of baseball, you can still enjoy it as a piece of drama. And I think, I think that's true of, you know, good, any good sports movie or, or, you know, sports TV show or whatever, if it's done in the right way, you don't get bogged down in, in sort of confusion over what's going on because it's the, the narrative kind of sells that to you. I have to say this conversation we're having uh, reminds me more. I don't know if have you guys seen, there's an old Monty Python sketch called, how do you do it? And it's um, Michael Palin and Terry Jones, I think. And one of them is explaining to the other one, how to play cricket. It's like a kind of, um, mock uh sort of chat show set up basically and the the host of this poor chat show just basically misunderstands everything the other guy says and gets confused about you know the is it the ground is it the pitch there's a discussion about balls and bales and it just gets more and more sort of farcical and, and, and mad but i guess part of the appeal of I, I wonder if there is a kind of in the same way as in star trek we see with baseball it's um it is this slightly obscure sport by that stage you know in the hypothetical future there is this kind of geeky element to it there you know the fact that there are all these obscure rules and and obviously we have in the episode odo you know kind of basically uh like red cards cisco for touching him red, and I don't know, I mean, red is, that, cards. is that something that is, <laughs> sure is that something that um that happens because it, he he sells that moment as if it's quite an obscure that, rule because he quotes all the, the rule book at him and then he says it does really yeah okay yeah okay it, especially yeah. when uh <clears throat> and you don't even have to touch an umpire like that's automatic ejection from the game and i know you use the that's what i was laughing about I use okay. the, the soccer term excuse me the football yeah. <laughs> term red card uh but yeah we just call it an ejection you get thrown out of the game and that's not just for managers that's for anybody like if a player like really starts to argue about balls and strikes with an umpire, they don't like that at all. They can throw you out. Like if you start wow. arguing about if a guy was safe or not, there was there was a manager, uh, Lou Pinella was famous for this, like kicking dirt around and throwing bases and all this stuff. And he would really get fired up. And he would do it a lot of times just to fire his team up. You know, like if your team's behind and they're like they they need some inspiration, light a fire under them. You know, you, as the manager, it's your role to go out there and fight for your guys. And then if you know coach gets thrown out, you're like, oh man, we got to win this one for coach. Now we got to stick with the umpires. Like so there there is even some strategy to that sometimes but other times people just get upset and they <laughs> they just flip flip out and those are always very much like a fight in a hockey game right it's very fun to see a manager get in an argument with an umpire at a baseball game i equate the two i bet yeah 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 but in terms <laughs> no, of like the, the obscure rule thing right i mean like that is certainly something which happens i mean and, and there is a nerdy aspect to it there's a uh, there's a there's a, a very nerdy subset to baseball fans you know the the guys who you'll see sitting in the upper deck with their scorecard where they're keeping track of every single play that's me by the way but you know i always keep score at a baseball game but like my dad is super nerdy in this in this respect my dad he loves baseball as much as you know i i love star trek you know it's it's his thing. And he, he's gotten to the point now where, you know, going back to like what you were saying about the sort of like professional, you know, aspect to it. Certainly he's a White Sox fan, but he ultimately doesn't care. He, he's, he's, he's the first to say these guys are all just mercenaries anyway. You know, like he just wants to see people play baseball. He doesn't care whether it's college or pro or high school or anything. He just wants to see baseball. But he's also very nerdy in terms of the rules and those obscure rules. And it's the type of thing now with like, you know, Twitter and everything, if there's a weird play that, that occurs or there's some sort of weird rule or, or something which is invoked, which never happens, like it becomes a, you know, a thing which which is showcased on, you know, MLB.com or whatever. And every, every time I see that, I send it to him. I'm like, oh, man, you got to check this out. This is the craziest thing you've ever seen. You got to check this out. So, I mean, there is definitely that. And I don't think that that really happens in stuff like football you know or, or basketball it's it's really only baseball and and maybe for people in the star trek universe you, you know baseball insofar as it's become this obscure game it is in a, it it is itself a part of history isn't it do you know what i mean they're they're partly getting into it for the kind of nostalgia value they're you, you know i mean you see that in say in, in the cards with this idea of collecting this collectible card you you know the kind of there's a kind of um it has that kind of quality. It's it's something. It's, it's an artifact from the past. You know, it is almost like Captain Picard's archaeology kind of um, 
fascination. And there's a kind of, I, I don't know whether maybe there is a sort of thing, I mean, because obviously they have sports that everyone plays, don't they, in Star Trek, like Parisi Squares or whatever. And, and baseball seems to be different to that. I mean, particularly like in the in, with Paul Stubbs in Evolution, in that episode, it seems like a very kind of obscure pastime. And I don't know whether that is a kind of, I mean, obviously, this is a future that doesn't have money, it doesn't have all these kind of commercial interests and so on. But at the same time, it it is sort of directly opposed to that somehow, the idea of sport as a hobby or games as a hobby. I mean, when I was at school, I used to play, I, I was never that into any of the kind of big sports. And I played an extremely obscure sport, which was called Fives, which probably most people even in England will never have heard of, which is a game that you play with gloves on your hands. And it's, uh, it, and, and it has a, it, it's a completely mad game, basically. It's a bit like, a bit like squash that you play with your hands, but in teams of two. And the court is sort of broadly speaking, like a squash court, but it has a step in the middle. So it's on two levels. And then on one side of the court, this is, it, the more I describe it, the more mad this is going to sound, is what's known as a buttress and the buttress is basically like a kind of wall that sticks out into the court from the left hand side and it has these weird has strange angles it's not like a wall it's like it's got uh, sort of diagonal angles on it it's got little steps on it and so on. and the reason is that this game was originally played at Eton the public public school um Eton in England posh you know fee paying school in England uh, and they played this game they invented this game around the side of their chapel and their chapel had these you know buttresses holding up the building which were these quite ornate architectural structures and so when they recreated this game they basically recreated the entire to- like fairly random environment that it had originally been played in complete with this step halfway down and this weird thing sticking out and the whole game sort of evolves around this totally bizarrely shaped court but I think part of the appeal I mean you know I was never a very sporty kid um, at school I never really wanted to play football or rugby or, or, or even cricket or whatever for me part of the appeal of playing this really obscure weird sport that no one took seriously was that it was kind of it wasn't mainstream do you know what I mean it wasn't kind of the, the oh, mainstream exactly. thing yeah. and I guess say, say for people in Star Trek you know, weirdly, because because in reality, baseball is pretty. Ma- I mean, you, you know, maybe football it, it has eclipsed it to some degree in America, but it's still pretty mainstream sport, right? But in Star Trek, it's something different, and so it's kind of I don't know. I, I wonder how that how that sort of works because it is ultimately an American TV show, and it's being watched by people who who see it in one way, but it's sort of so it's sort of playing back and forth between that. You know, is this this kind of mainstream activity, or is this this kind of obscure activity? In the same way that we see with Star Trek, with a lot of things, whenever they go into like twentieth century popular culture or whatever, there's that kind of you know, there's always that kind of joke that what to us seems mainstream and normal to them seems obscure and confusing and ridiculous. It's an ancient Earth vehicle called a truck, Captain. It's like, yeah, really, exactly, guys? That know. was like 200 years ago. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think, you know, Michael Piller, being a huge baseball fan, is the whole mm. reason we're having this conversation. Like, if he was a basketball fan, Cisco would have a basketball <laughs> on his desk, you know? So yeah. uh, him bringing baseball in from, you know, season three evolution, you know, uh, like you talk about uh, Dr. Stubbs. I call him Dr. Kelso from Scrubs. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, th- th- that's really the first uh, – well, other than the big goodbye, obviously, where they talk about uh, – Buck Bokai. Does it um, does it follow though that Brandon Braga is a big water polo fan? Because that's yeah, you know, you know, I, I thought about that with Enterprise one, because uh, you know you were talking about this is for American audiences. Everyone has a general understanding yeah, yeah. of baseball. That's why the jokes work. Yeah. I'm taking me out to Hall Suite. It's funny because you you, yeah. you you see Archer playing water polo and you're like, you know what? I don't. I, I know as much about water polo as Kira does about baseball. So you know, it's kind yeah. of a, a yeah, yeah, societal yeah. disconnect there for me. But uh, but yeah, I I think uh, you're right. You know, be, being baseball fans first and foremost. Uh, Mike and I, it's like we feel like, man, baseball, the golden age, the glory days, it's fallen off. It's not America's pastime anymore, so we feel a little slighted. But like you're right, it, it's still one of the big three sports. It's it's football, basketball, and baseball in whatever order. Uh, hockey's kind of coming up the rear there, and then you know soccer. Although it's popular worldwide, it's not you know so popular in the United States. It's getting there, you know, it's getting there, mm-hmm. but but it's not nowhere near on the same plane as as uh the the big three so uh, i you know and uh, thinking about what you're saying i i totally get what you're saying duncan it's 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 it, you embrace it because it's like obscure you know right against the mainstream like i could equate people like liking baseball in the 24th century is like people listening to vinyl now right it's like oh man yeah. it's, it's more pure man it's like okay yeah, yeah, sure yeah. <laughs> but yeah. I, I think that's an element to it as well well the other thing about baseball of course is it's you know and even from an english perspective it's part of 20th century culture in a way that's inescapable i mean one of you earlier i think used the expression on the fly i think maybe when when mike was was explaining the in 
in fly in field, field fly roll. So that yes. rule. There you go. Yeah, yeah. I use the expression on the fly. It never occurred to me until now that that is a baseball expression. And you know, we have lots of expressions like you know, saying something is left field. That's a baseball expression, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, like to me, those are just they're what we call dead metaphors. You, you know, they're metaphors where you're not really aware necessarily. Uh, you can you can use them in language without really being aware of what they're referring to, and and it's just you know it becomes part of language. You hit a home run on that time, one. That's another. Yeah, one exactly. I hear people say a, lot. a home run. I feel like that. Would, I I definitely recognise that was baseball, and even like all these bases. I mean, like you know, first base, second base. You, you know, I I know about bases from watching like American teen you know dramas. <laughs> uh, well, I never quite understood how many bases. There are because I get you get to people. Have, they talk about going to third base, right? But is there, there's a fourth base? Is that yeah, right? Home, home plate, plate is the fourth base. I mean, if you, if you're using that analogy, you wouldn't be home plating. You'd what, be you'd be what, scoring going, is what you'd yes. be doing. So what's the? I, I don't want to get us an explicit rating. Right? No, I, I mean, I you, third base well, no, was no but as far as like what, what, what the everything in actually between? is, <laughs> as far yeah. as like what everything actually is in that analogy, nobody knows. It's all, you know, every everyone's just making it up as they go as far as... You mean as, there isn't a secret code? It doesn't no, all... It's very not. subjective. They're, they're just, they're different <laughs> okay. levels to physical intimacy that can relate to the basis of baseball, and we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I thought I was missing out on something. Well, there you go. But anyway, I mean, so, that, so that anyway, that's, it's kind of entered the language, I guess is what I'm saying. It's entered the kind of cultural, you know, world in a sense. But also, I suppose there's a question... That you know, I'm sort of wondering what what does it represent in Star Trek? So we talked a bit about how it represents this thing that's quite obscure and and kind of pure as a kind of sport, and also it ties into our own world. But I think it also, particularly in Deep Space Nine, it 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 becomes this really significant thing. I mean, the physically the baseball prop becomes very significant because you know if you look at uh, say the way that whole occupation arc of the station is structured, you get at the end Cisco leaves his his baseball behind and Ducat says to Wayun that this is a message he's saying he's going to be back and then at the end of that arc they have the sort of repeat of this motif where Ducat hands the baseball back to him so even this Cardassian who presumably doesn't know anything about baseball kind of knows enough about Cisco to imbue it with this kind of weighty significance in a sense and then later on at the end of the sixth season when Cisco leaves the fact that he takes the baseball with him is really significant because it's kind of uh you you know again they're kind of playing this thing so it's almost like it's such an important prop for him because it represents something kind of fundamental about his sort of authority or his you know ability to to be it's almost like a kind of you know like some ancient medieval mace or something do you, do you know what i mean like the man who holds the who holds the baseball holds the station or something there's some weird kind of <laughs> symbolic thing going on and then of course it's the baseball that helps him find the the orb that he's looking for you, you know it kind of magically rolls off the piano and it does all this stuff so so that ball like that physical prop has assumed this whole sort of layers of meaning and significance and and, and so on um you know far beyond just literally being you know, like any other object that's dotted around, you know, like Captain Picard. I suppose you see it a bit with Captain Picard's book of Shakespeare. It has some of that quality because it seems so significant. But, you know, they all have these things dotted around their ready rooms and so on. But that that baseball seems to hold a lot more meaning, I suppose, than a lot of those other props. I, I think that it's it's really cool that they do that. I mean, I don't know, part of it is just kind of like on a personal level because, like, my dad would... He, he's, for you know, for years and years and years, for decades, he's done the same thing kept a baseball on his desk at work and everything and i I do the same thing now too actually i've got one sitting on an r2d2 at at uh at at my in my office and you know i i don't know if the i mean the reason why it's a baseball obviously is because it's sort of like built into cisco's character but i don't think that it being a baseball is necessarily all that significant it's more that this is an object which represents cisco you know and certainly that's certainly that's like baked into the show with with emissary and everything like that and you know it 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 stands to reason that that would be what he keeps in his office because it's something which you can just kind of like toss around while you're you're brainstorming or whatever and yeah i don't know like is is that a like it does it relate to the game itself I kind of don't think so. You know what I mean? I think it's more, it could be any object. It could be, you know, Picard, Shakespeare, or or whatever, you know. But just the idea that it is a ball which you can hold in your hand, obviously, 
you know, makes it a bit, and, and you can display like a trophy, you know, that, that makes it a bit more effective as a prop than say like a massive book would you, you know i mean we see it with picard a lot i suppose you know he's got his shakespeare he's also got you know his flute from um the inner light he's he's got that uh like an animal hide he's got those little orange panels on his desk that no one knows their purpose or what they're there for <laughs> those yeah. two little orange control panels <laughs> Oh right, okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say he's also got the, the that uh, the like the Russian doll equivalent thing, the the Curlin nice. Oh nice yeah, that, that he just throws called? away yeah, at yeah, the end of generation. That he tosses yeah. away at the end of generation. <laughs> he's he's got his crystal too. <laughs> got a new, you the, the crystal, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like was he talking to Jorel on that? What is that <laughs> for? But, uh... So yeah, maybe it, maybe it's maybe it's just the same. I suppose the other way of looking at it though is what does I mean, particularly in in take take me out to the Hollow Suite. What does this represent and and watching that episode and also you know rewatching in the cards this week which is not really about baseball but it, it but it kind of it uses that kind of nostalgic uh element to kind of give it a bit of weight and and the fact that it's so personal to Cisco and we and we believe that it's so personal to Cisco the idea that you know that Jake would think it would mean a lot to him to have this card is that i think with take me out to the hollow suite it's a really they're both really nice episodes. They're both, you know, they're very funny. They're very well done and so on. But they also have a real heart to them. And I suppose, and one of the things that Cisco talks about in Take Me Out to the Hollow Suite is, he he says at the beginning, we're going to beat the Vulcans because we have more heart than they do. And this is a game where, you know, faith and heart and all these, these kind of intangible things are going to count for more than kind of pure physical strength and skill and so on. And then by the time you get to the end of the episode, there's this kind of, weird victory where they they've they've still catastrophically lost this game but at the same time they're able to kind of rise above it they're able to be they're able to be good losers and part of it i suppose is about sportsmanship it's about kind of what we were talking about about playing the game for its own sake playing it for enjoyment you know recognizing that it's better to give rom a chance to bat than uh you know someone who might actually score for the team because that's that's what games are meant to be about and that's what team spirit is about we're sort of recognizing what the value of sport is quite a, it's not all about winning it's not all about competitiveness and so on and i can't help thinking that in deep space nine that does tie into this kind of broader thing about the war you know there's this for a lot of that war dominion war arc there's this kind of sense that they're going to lose the war everyone expects them to lose the war you know you've had in statistical probabilities there's this kind of argument well we we can't we don't think we can win this war and but then you've got people like Cisco and O'Brien saying I don't care I don't care what the facts are I don't care about that you know we're going to do our best that's what we do it's kind of almost sort of you know sort of spiritual position and I think in some ways that idea of being a good loser and kind of treating uh, it, it's like well I was talking about Wimbledon earlier you know there's famously when you go out onto the court at Wimbledon they have this. Um, line by Rajad Kipling from the poem If and it says if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same it's kind of that idea of not being not letting your defeat just crush you somehow do you know what I mean being defiant in the face of of all that and I, I do think like with that episode it kind of it ties into some sort of bigger broader kind of theme that's going on around being the underdog being in this impossible situation fighting the good fight even when the odds are against you even when you know maybe you don't even really expect to win but kind of clawing some kind of victory out of that that idea i guess kind of hits close to home as someone who throughout his you know little league career was consistently on losing teams <laughs> <laughs> and i mean it's something which I, I was sort of like kind of like raised to believe too i mean you know going back to my dad like all of my baseball love and whatever comes from my dad and he was very much of the philosophy of like this is just a game and you know no one loved the game more than him but perhaps it was growing up as a, a a White Sox fan and, you know, the fact that they had not won a World Series since 1917 or whatever. But, you know, he would coach a lot of my teams and his philosophy was always like, everyone is here to have fun. You know, we, we, we want to win. And, uh, you know, more importantly than that, we want to teach people how to play. But 
first and foremost, it's about having fun and giving everyone a chance. And because of that, you know, where other teams would put, you know, their best, you know, players out on the field and everything and, and leave some kids who weren't so talented sort of sitting on the bench for the majority of the game, my dad was very insistent on sort of like giving everyone an equal chance and, and all that stuff. And the result was losing lots and lots of games. But I feel like as far as life is concerned, I was taught, you know, more important lessons that way than I, I would be if, if we had won. You know what I mean? And I think that that's kind of like the realization that Cisco comes to in Take Me Out to the Hall of Suite. I mean, I think that's probably something that he knew from the beginning. He just kind of lost sight of it, giving that specific, you know, instance. But, uh, yeah, I mean... the that there's something to that. I think that that's kind of like a universal thing. I don't think it necessarily just applies to, to baseball, but you know, I think that that's something about sport in general. Yeah. I think it is. I think it is universal, but I do think baseball lends itself more to that exploration because it's a lot less intense than the other sports, right? If you're basketball, soccer, you're running up and down, back and forth, football, you're, you're crashing into each other, you're tackling, physically tackling people, you know? So there, there's a certain level of intensity you need to bring to playing those competitions. For baseball, you know, it's a little, it's a little more chill, it's a little more relaxed, you know? Uh, and then also everyone gets their moment in the sun. You go up to the plate for your moment to bat. So, like, everybody on the team gets their one moment. Like, you don't get like you don't get lost in the shuffle like on football. You know, you got 11 guys on each side. You know, if you're some, like, offensive tackle off on the side, like, the whole game can go by and, like, the, you, the spotlight is never on you. But baseball, you know, there's a rotation. You know, there's a lineup. You're, you're coming up to bat every, you know, nine people. And so all eyes are on you and you get your moment to shine. So I think that that uh, creates more more of a – a good avenue to explore the things we're talking about, about like, you know, everybody has their place and teamwork and this or that. And we're just here to have fun. We're not here to, of course we, we want to win, but you know, there's other things beyond it. And I think baseball is a better venue to explore that in storytelling than the other sports. I think it's also, it's, I mean, certainly that kind of with all te- you know, with all sports where, where people support a team, there's kind of the worst thing is the person who's like the, 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 glory chaser do you know what i mean who just supports the team they think is going to win and they don't front runner yes um, (laughs) yeah exactly you know um whereas the idea is kind of that you should definitely you should you know you should accept your your team losing and you should kind of sort of be a a good loser about that and real you you know have that kind of team spirit and i suppose also the other thing that's quite nice about well both those both both take me out to the holo suite and and also in the cards in a sense is is that you get a strong sense. One, one of the things I thought was nice about, I mean, Cisco is kind of a jerk in that episode. You know, he behaves quite badly. Um, we understand why he's behaving badly, but at the same time, he's, he's difficult to like in some ways, but at the same time, because he has such a good relationship with his crew, because they're all, you know, they, they, they are like a sort of family by that point. Everyone is willing, especially once they learn the story of why it's happened, everyone is willing to really put themselves out for, you know, to try and make their friend feel better about something or to try and make them happy or whatever. And, you know, in the same way, you've got Jake doing the same thing, trying to cheer him up by, you know, these these quite, si- I suppose what it is, they're quite silly, trivial things. I mean, like the baseball card seems like it's a kind of MacGuffin, but it's quite a sort of silly MacGuffin. But at the same time, we accept that silly, trivial things can mean a lot to people. And this this beating this team of Vulcans, especially in the context of this war, which is going on and, you know, there are really big things at stake. It's the fact that the stakes are so low on one level um and a kind of that it is this kind of trivial silly sort of pissing contest but that all his crew and all his friends sort of take it so seriously that you know they're really committed to it they are a team and so it's it's not only that sense of like what it means to be supporting a team whatever but really kind of you know everyone is mucking in everyone is trying to do their best even for this thing that they don't frankly they don't understand the rules they you know they're not very good at it they they don't necessarily really understand the point of why it's important to win this thing but it's important to him they get that it's important to him and they want to do whatever they can to kind of uh support that so it's got i guess that's what i'm saying is it feels like it's without being really kind of cloying and obvious it is a, a show that really it does sort of encompass all the best, all those sort of cliched messages that you hear about sport that, you, you know, the, the, the positive things that sport's meant to give people about, you know, working as a team or, or, you know, dealing with ups and downs or all these sort of things. It does somehow manage to kind of pack all of that into that story in a way that 
that really works. Well, yeah, well, well said, Duncan. I, I could not say that better than you did. So I'll just add to it uh, to, to your expand on your point about Cisco being a jerk. I think, you know, you play sports with people. You see a whole different side of people than you usually see, you know. So yeah. I think I think that's very true to life. Like, oh, whoa, okay, like, oh, this is how it's going to be, yeah. you know, because you know <laughs> you, you can be friends and you're laughing, but when you put someone in a competitive situation like that, like, like, yeah. so you, there's a certain side of people that comes out sometimes and it takes you by surprise. And I think that's that's spot on about how Cisco would be in that situation with these guys because he's never, I mean, he's watched baseball with them, he's told them about baseball, like, but the actual like play baseball with these guys and and want to to win and, and and the frustration he has when his team is just not very good <laughs> you know it's mm-hmm. it's it's funny and that it's very true to life as well yeah well it's also i guess I mean, it, it is funny though because you see you know you, we've seen him in life and death situation we've seen him in objectively much more stressful situations <laughs> right. not losing his rag like that but i think it's also i mean when i first watched that episode as a teenager i think i felt more critical of him and more less sympathetic towards him whereas watching it now i don't know why watching it now i kind of maybe it's just partly like being older and and the idea of you know this guy who's been niggling at him for you know whatever it's like 20 years or something you kind of think god that he he really needs to be taken down a notch you know this vulcan guy he 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 works more as a kind of villain of the piece for me now than he did when I first watched that show where the whole thing just seemed kind of silly and, and pointless. Do you know what I mean? So I don't know whether that's kind of sort of a matter of kind of embracing your own pettiness and your own, because that's sort of what it comes down to in a way, isn't it? Is it's, it's kind of embracing his not captain Picard would never get in that situation. Captain Picard would just rise above it and say, well, yeah, you know, I got in a silly fight with this guy 20 years ago or whatever. Um, but, you know, I'm over that now and I'm a different person and so on. But, you, you know, it's, it's quite in keeping with Deep Space Nine, I suppose, that, you know, someone, even the captain, is in this situation where because he can't do that, because he can't get over his own sort of issues, everyone else has to come on board and kind of support his issues and try and, uh, you know, kind of play that game for him. It's very much not the kind of... It, I mean, what's interesting is it's a different message. It's very much not the kind of Gene Roddenberry Star Trek message. But at the same time, it is a real Star Trek message. It is a real sort of positive message at the end of the day. Well, to, uh, to kind of kind of wrap it over, I think we need we need to talk about Buck Bokai. This guy. Okay. He, he's, <laughs> Let's talk a bit more about Buck Bokai. So he, he gets mentioned in The Big Goodbye. You know, Data's reading about how, how he broke Joe DiMaggio's streak, which which still could still happen, by the way. It's, it's Joe DiMaggio is still the, the holder of that... Uh, of that hit streak, um, they they do mention Roger Maris. I uh, believe in the in the most toys. That is not correct anymore. But maybe there maybe there's going to be asterisks on things of the steroid era. Okay. You never know how you never know how the rules are going to all come out at the end, right? So so there's still there's still a chance Star Trek for, for it's you like Fermat's last theorem. Yeah, being, exactly. Being solved and then oh, unsolved again. Yeah. We, we found a new uh, string of it. <laughs> like yeah, sure, whatever, guys. But um, Buck Boca, you hear about him, and then he's a, he's supposed to be a shortstop for the London Kings, which is interesting that they put baseball across the pond that way. Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, at, at the same time, they forecasted its expansion and its demise. So interesting uh, there. Well, I guess it expanded first, but also it sort of raises. So, so well, yeah. So, and they were in the World Series, right? When presumably it was a genuinely a World genuinely Series, genuinely a World if, Series, if it, if it actually <laughs> involved at least two countries. But then, um, yeah, well, that's, that's, that's yeah. What no, I was reading it. a pa- oh, according yeah, that's to the, that's what killed it. He they yeah. played at Battersea in London. <laughs> I like that's what that. killed like, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Well, there's no way Buck Bokai was a shortstop. I mean, look at that. When he shows up and if wishes were horses, you're like, this guy? Like, maybe he's, he's a pretty catcher. short. Is that... <laughs> you know, maybe he could be a first baseman, a designated hitter. No way he's a shortstop. Maybe maybe the aliens from well, Wishes Were Horses took a representation of him from later in his career. Maybe he started out as a shortstop and he got moved to DH as, as the years went on. Maybe like, you know, Alex Rodriguez or something like that. Uh, but you look at that guy and, and he look, he's very Babe Ruth type. So I get that because Babe Ruth is the best baseball player of all time. Uh, even though he looks just like a normal guy he looks like he, he's more at home in the stands than the dugout you know babe ruth if you look yeah. at him uh, but that's the great paradox of babe ruth you know and so so it's like just right. kind of just pudgy kind of guy <laughs> you know being the being the best baseball player of all time uh so I, I just thought that was kind of a disconnect especially if we're talking about because baseball players you look at old pictures of them from like the 30s the 40s or they look like just average joes nowadays right you know that they're they're just as athletic Athletes. as anybody, yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, and then if you're going to keep extrapolating that in the future, I forget exactly what year the London Kings were around, uh, the 2020s, I believe. I think that, I think soon, then. That's, that's like five years from now. Out. So. <laughs> where's where's Buck Fokai? Where's the next Buck Fokai? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah I, think, I think he would have been more like a, 
streamlined kind of ath- athletic looking guy than than the guy they they got uh you know just, I would just a nitpick so, as a baseball but... fan that's just something i zeroed down i'm like this guy's a shortstop because shortstop is one of the most athletic positions uh right. on, on the field so that that was just my take on their representation of of the newest greatest player of all time <laughs> Well, I think he looked, didn't he look a bit like, because they'd had an image of Buck Bakai before that was taken, there was actually a picture of one of the, like the illustrators or, you know, you know, someone who worked behind the scenes, I think. And then, and then the guy they cast sort of looked a bit like him. Is that right? Was that, there was a sort of story. Yeah, I think somewhere that's, along, that's along those lines, I think. Yeah. I forget who yeah, it was, yeah. but yeah, yeah. That makes sense. He's quite charming though, that guy, I think. I mean, he's sort of, and it, it, again, it sort of fits with, with this idea of Cisco as being passionate about this, I guess, like you say, someone who might be in the stands, this kind of this sort of amateur uh, enthusiasm for it. And he's got I mean, you, you know, Cisco himself in the in the later years of the series is, you know, he's got a little bit of a paunch on him and he's got, you, you know, he's still he's still enthusiastic about his game, isn't it? It's kind of he's uh, he's not still, you know, in perfect. He's not in kind of Jonathan Archer trim shape, but um, I don't know. I think I think that kind of but it's interesting. I suppose that's one of those things that you know it might be the same if there's like a science thing and to the scientists it it raises all these red flags and someone else it goes over their head like to me i don't know what a shortstop is so it doesn't really i I find it slightly odd that this pudgy guy was meant to be the best baseball player ever but i didn't find it hard (laughs) to believe that he might be a baseball player particularly well you talk about the changing rules to kind of bring it all back to what we were talking about earlier babe ruth right greatest baseball player of all time he was a pitcher all right, people mm-hmm. don't realize this so if he played today if babe ruth played today in the rules of the american league he would never bat he would never the greatest home run hitter of all time. <laughs> he would never bat. Isn't that crazy? How baseball the, the rules change. I mean, because but until the seventies, there was no designated hitter. So of the nine positions, you know, at, at National League and American League, each has nine positions. The American League has a tenth position called the designated hitter, and this position bats instead of the pitcher. This was a rule invented in the seventies when attendance was down. So they said, okay, let's get a, let's get a guy in here whose job is just to hit, and that's the designated hitter, and he will take the place of the pitcher in the batting uh, order. So, uh, and so the you, batter, uh, is there a batter? No. Yeah, <laughs> every, everyone's a batter. Hitter. <laughs> <laughs> everyone's a batter a batter and hitter, a hitter are the same thing yes yeah, so the am, am i using them okay, but a picture is different okay. but uh cool. but yes yeah, so, so even though mm. even though you have 10 people on the lineup that day only nine of the bat and the designated hitter bats for the pitcher when when the pitcher's uh slot comes up in the in the batting order this guy bats instead of him you know i think i'm in danger of uh of of ending up like uh colonel kira distinctly uh <laughs> just getting just getting more confused the more we talk about this but um but it's been great chatting to the two of you about baseball and and hearing uh you know doing my best to to try and get my head around at least a few of the rules and uh i'll definitely if i, if I find myself in the vicinity of a baseball field i'll uh i'll <laughs> I'll try and check it out. Definitely, definitely. Hey, when I was in Paris, we found the um, the national championships over there at some random, small, tiny field out in the middle of nowhere. So, so worst case scenario, if you're ever in Paris, they were playing baseball in Paris. Yeah, it was really. It was. Wow. I mean, it was crazy. I mean, that was like the highlight of my trip, honestly, because it's like <laughs> they're okay. They've got a, a league in France, and the 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 national championships are going to be. But then, you know, we go out there and it's literally just like a public park with about as many people as you'd see at a high school game here. And Mm -hmm. the the level of play was probably about the same level as like a high school team in America. (laughs) Mm -hmm. But it was great. It was so great. They were grilling hamburgers and everything. I mean, you know, it was France, so they were like basically raw. But, you know... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but i mean it really was they were like let's do let's have a baseball game like right out here in the middle of yeah. nowhere it was yeah, pretty yeah, great yeah. it yeah. really was yeah well if you want to watch a documentary about baseball so i can watch ken burns baseball so i decide like a week okay. it'll take you that long okay. if you want to watch yeah. a serious a serious movie about baseball field of dreams yeah. i know mike no, doesn't like it garbage. mike's over here talking about him and his dad and baseball yet he doesn't like field of dreams <laughs> I saw Field of Dreams on a Greyhound bus after a, a very long and tiring trip around America, and I, I don't think I was in the best um, place to, to to take it in. But it it no, it it's really just a garbage movie. That's, well, that's all, all, all that aside, if if you want to have a good time, <laughs> the the most fun baseball yeah. movie, Major League, hilarious film. 
Major League. Okay. I definitely That's recommend it. Not an accurate statement at all. But <laughs> Mike and I Mike and I might be baseball fans. We have very different tastes in baseball movies. Now you see, really. I thought you'd be arguing about your teams more, but <laughs> this is if, this is where we really get into the If you want to see the absolute best baseball movie of all time, which I think is also really interesting in terms of like the idea of baseball being a business and everything, but also being competitive within that structure. Moneyball is is clearly that that's the best okay, baseball. I, I agree movie. with you. I, li- I like Moneyball. I don't know if it's the best. I I think uh, there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff in that movie. I think yeah. for uh, the actual sport if, itself, if you want something, if else you want be the best depiction of the sport in a dramatic fashion, this is going to be an unpopular opinion, but it's <laughs> it's accurate. Sam Raimi's for love of the game. Oh, that is the worst of the three Kevin Costner baseball movies, man. What are you doing? Whatever. <laughs> Whatever. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, it's been a pleasure talking baseball with the two of you. So thank you both for joining me. Before I let you go, do you want to tell the listeners where they can find you uh, online and elsewhere on the Trek FM network? Uh, yeah, you can find me um, on, on Trek FM doing a show called Stage 9 where we talk about the people who make Star Trek. And you can also find me here uh, doing a show called The Edge where we talk about Star Trek Discovery. And you can find me on various other places on the internet like... Uh, TheNerdParty.com doing a show called Great Shot Kid and CommentaryTrackStars.com doing a show called Commentary Track Stars. And you can find me on Twitter at Mumbles3K. As for me, you can find me here on the network every week on Standard Orbit talking about the original series with my friend Ken Tripp. We talk about the original series, talk about the movies, talk about the Kelvin timeline. So anything with Captain Kirk and crew, old or new, we're talking about over there. Uh, you can also find me as the host of my own podcast, Always Hold On to Smallville where you can hear me talk about each and every episode of that young Superman show. And you can find us on Twitter at Always Mallville. And then for me personally, I'm on Twitter at MoronZach, M-O-O-R-E-O-N-Z-A-C-H. Well, it's been fun, if slightly bewildering for me, uh, listening to Zach and Mike uh, tell me about their love of baseball and talking about the role that it plays in Star Trek. But that's not the only thing that's been going on on Trek FM this week. So here's a listen at what else you might have missed out on on the network. Previously on Trek.fm. To the journey! And then, you know, they're all up on the bridge and everyone's like, oh, what's Belana doing with her day off? And Tom's like, oh, she's binge watching Bill Nye. <laughs> <laughs> she's been there, you know, in her PJs since 8 o'clock this morning. <laughs> I can picture she's been watching Bill Nye all day. Tom comes home and she says to Tom, you know, Tom, have you ever thought about wearing a bow tie? You might look good. <laughs> <laughs> but if he's on the bridge and says all that, would Captain Janeway know who Bill Nye the science guy is? Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's Janeway. The 602 Club. So I graduated from high school in 1984. So this film came out in my, what, sophomore year in high school? So that was like prime formative years for me. Um, this is, you know, uh, this and Mad Max were the R-rated movies that me and all of my friends wanted to go see. Earl Grey. Now, Aquiel is a... Uh, Jordy episode and I say that and I laugh because poor Jordy he just does not know how to find women and um <laughs> that's put it in lately but yeah guy meta treks yeah but what what fun would that be that's a, then we wouldn't have red shirts what fun is that Zachary what fun is that Cancel Troy that is a smashing looking 70 nanometer wavelength dress <laughs> <laughs> and that's what else is happening on trek.fm so check out all of these shows and join in the conversation about your favorite corner of the star trek universe and beyond you'll find us wherever you get your podcasts if you're an apple user be sure to hit the subscribe button in apple podcasts on iphone ipad or apple tv or the desktop itunes app to get the latest episodes as soon as they are published And please do leave us a star rating and a written review at the same time. If you're not an Apple user, we've got you covered as well. You can find our shows on Google Play Music, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spreaker, SoundCloud, Windows Phone, and in most third-party apps. And you can stream and download the MP3 file from our website or grab the RSS link. If you'd also like to help us keep all our shows coming to you each week, you can become a patron of the network on Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash trekfm, that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm to get all the details. 
Perks include early access to episodes, exclusive content, producer credits, and more, available through our special patrons website, The Patron Zone. It requires a great deal of money to produce, host, and distribute these shows each month, so we really appreciate any support you can give us, and we hope you'll join the team. Again, you'll find all the details at patreon.com slash trekfm. Duncan and I would love to hear your thoughts on today's show, and there are many ways for you to get involved and do just that. The best place to join in the large conversation is the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type Babel, B-A-B-E-L, into the search field on Facebook, and it should come right up. If you'd like to send us an email, you can use the form on our website at trek.fm slash contact. You can also find the network on Twitter at trek.fm and on Facebook at facebook.com slash trek.fm. You can find Duncan and I on the Babel Conference as well, and you can find us both on Twitter, Duncan at Barrett's Books, and myself, Tony, at Black Hole Media. And you can also find me hosting my own podcast, the Xcast and X-Files podcast, if you type that into Twitter and Facebook. So thanks, everyone, for listening to this episode of Primitive Culture. We'll be back soon to discuss more history, culture, and how Star Trek relates to it. You're blended already.